We are continuing our theme on don't give up. And in Hebrews, we're going to be looking in chapter 11 today. Specifically, verses 35 through 38. Well, let me back up there. We're going to be looking at chapter 11, verses 1 through 3, I believe, is, is going to be our reading of our text, verses 8 through 16. And I, I, I don't know if I'll read it, but I want to encourage you to read 35 through 38 at some point, because it kind of goes along with this as well. But the opening words of one of the best-selling books of the 80s and 90s, The Road Less Traveled by Scott Peck, begins with these three words. <clears throat> Life is difficult. I read this book not in the 80s and 90s, but much later when I was going through a difficult time in my life. And the impact of this book and these words, I think, were very profound in my life. Yes, life is difficult. But we're not alone in this journey. So listen to the words from the scriptures in Hebrews chapter 11. Uh, look at verse. Let me see where we've got here. I've got uh, verse 11, right? Uh, chapter 11. And I think we start in verse 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commanded or commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abraham, when was called to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundation, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith. When they died, they did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that, they're not, uh, that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have an opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. This is not the first time in history that these three words, life is difficult, has had a lot of meaning. Remember the words in Revelation chapter 1, when John the Revelator said that he was on the isle or the island of Patmos on the Lord's day and he was caught up in the spirit. Now think about that for a moment. John said, I was on the island of Patmos. Now, when we think of an island, we think of uh, sandy beaches and we think of Cancun or we think of the Bahamas or maybe closer to us would be Myrtle Beach. We think of it a vacation. But this was no vacation. This was an island of death. He was on a prison colony, sent in exile. And he was in despair. And he was destitute. And it was a very dark time. It was sort of like 
if you imagine the prison camps of World War II, that was kind of what it was. And so John said, here I am on this island of Patmos. Life is difficult. But then he goes on to say, there was another part to that. I was in the spirit <laughs> on the Lord's day. And I think of the Apostle Paul when he was thrown in prison in the book of Acts. And at midnight, they sang songs and praises to God. John is saying, yes, life is difficult. But he's also saying this. There's another part of that truth. Another half. God is good. Life is difficult but God is good. Which one is true? Well, they're both true, right? They're both true. If you think about it, uh, both of those things make sense, and both of those have some truth to it. I want to turn your attention to the Scriptures. If you have your Bibles ready, you feel free to open them. I think I have Sandy's Bible here, so uh, you have another one there. <laughs> but we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 4. Uh, The text I want to uh, I want to just mention in Philippians four is where it says Paul says to rejoice and hold your place there because we're going to turn to Second Corinthians chapter four. But in Philippians four he says and this is while he's in prison he writes rejoice again I say rejoice and if somebody finds that verse let me know because I've. <laughs> the, the, the verse is in there. Sandy is singing it, in case you didn't know. But rejoice, and again I say rejoice. And he talks about the peace of God that passes all understanding. Have you found that yet? When you find that, you can let me know. And then uh, we're looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 4. But anyway, Paul says that we need to rejoice. Sorry, I, I forgot to write that down. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul talks about uh, here seeing the invisible. And he says in verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. As Christians, he says, we don't want to give up. We don't want to lose heart. That's really what he's saying. Though the outward person is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And then notice what he says there in verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. It's just a moment in comparison to eternity. It works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So our light affliction is momentarily, it's temporary, but we're working and looking toward that eternal reward. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but which, at the things which are not seen. And let's move on up to chapter 5 there. In chapter 5, Paul talks about some things that, uh, that they were going through there. Uh, how that... They were uh, being tortured. Let's see if I can find that. I'm going to look at, uh, I think it's verse 5. Now, he that has prepared for us this very thing is God, and who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to back up. It's in chapter 4. I'm, I'm kind of discombobulated. Just look over me. It's not the first time. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 7. Are you there? <laughs> 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Now, then he goes on to talk about some good things and some bad things. I want you to help me out here, okay? If you have your Bibles, uh, you, don't, you don't even have to have your Bibles. But when I point to you, and those out there in the camera, and those of you in here, 
There's three of you out here. <laughs> when I point to you, the first time, when I, after I read this, you say, life is difficult. Okay? The second time I point to you, you say, God is good. Y'all have that? Everybody out there listening? So when I point the first time, life is difficult. The second time, God is good. Yes. Life is difficult. God is good. Are you ready? Okay, we're going to be in verse 8. We are hard pressed on every side. Yes, good job. We are hard pressed on every side. Yet not crushed. God is good. We are perplexed. But not in despair. Persecuted. But not forsaken. Amen. Life is difficult. God is good. We understand that. We understand that, that our lives sometimes may be tested and tried. And most of us have never experienced what the apostles ever experienced in maybe one day of their life or even at the end of their lives. And our trials are compared to them are much less. But they're still trials. They're still hard sometimes. And right now, people are suffering and people are hurting and people are scared. Life is difficult. But we must, that's only half the truth. We got to remember that, yes, life is difficult, but God is good. Please listen to me. God is still on the throne. And this thing is going to pass. And you know what gets people through these times? You know, he talked about Abraham and he talked about all the people that were looking for that promise and looking for a city. You know what kept them going even though they could not see it and some of them didn't even experience in their lifetime? What kept them going? What was it? It was one thing. It was faith. Faith kept them going. The hope that out there somewhere, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith that we talked about, that they were looking for a city. They were looking for a Savior. They were looking for something down the road. And today, some people are very scared and some people are very uh, worried about everything that's going on today. But we must get our eyes off of the circumstances and turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You know what I love about God? When I think about John the Revelator and how he was on this island of death, caught up in the spirit on the Lord's day, it tells me that <clears throat> That in the midst of something really terrible, God is able to do something great. That in the midst of the worst thing that could happen, God is in the business of doing the best things. So sometimes if you're old enough to look back on your life, you can look back and see those times in your life where at the time you thought it was the worst thing that could ever happen to you. You thought, man, this is, this is it. But now you can look back on it and say, you know what? I'm kind of glad that happened because if that hadn't happened, I wouldn't be where I am today. Or if, if that job hadn't have ended there, I wouldn't be in this job. Or if that uh, particular relationship hadn't have, worked, had have, hadn't have stopped, I wouldn't be where I am now. And so you could see the hand of God in those times. I remember seven or eight years ago, I was on the elder track in the United Methodist Church to be a full-time elder in the Methodist Church. And I did all the work. I had my Master of Divinity and all of that and turned in. It was a lot of paperwork I had to do and prepare some sermons and different things. And all that was needed now was for me to meet with a team called the Barnabas team for them to approve so I got a phone call one day that three of the people on the Barnabas team wanted to meet with me in a particular church. And so I go and 
this was an unscheduled meeting. <clears throat> and as I'm sitting there, they had, uh, they had talked and decided that they felt like I needed more time. And they wanted me to wait and reapply in a couple years. In other words, I was being rejected for being commissioned in the United Methodist Church as an elder. And I, I would have to wait two years to even reapply and start the whole process all over again. Well, needless to say, I was devastated. I sat down in that chair that day and I broke down in front of those men and I cried. Because I felt like this was the worst thing that could happen. I, I had worked so hard and I felt like I was ready. And to be honest, I think they got it wrong. <laughs> but I, I, I really, really believe that God used that to do something much better in my life. Because not long after that, I think at that time I was maybe a part-time chaplain. But not long after that, the position came open at the hospital for me to be a full-time chaplain. And I looked at that as God's will for my life. And I became a full-time chaplain. And I realized not too much further into that, that this is really my calling in, in, in addition to being a, a pastor a chaplain. And so I went on to get more chaplain education and started going to CPE, clinical pastoral education classes, and drove to Louisville uh, for a couple years. Every Sunday night, I would go down, and uh, Sandy let me go, and I would go all the way down to Louisville every Sunday night, stay with my, my kids live down there, and uh, stay with them, and then in class all day Monday, and come back on Monday night. Four to completed the four units. But what I'm trying to say is what I thought at that time was the worst thing that could happen, probably in my, as I look back on it, was a good thing. Or at least God used it and turned it into something good. Because I believe that, that God is able to take the things that happen to us if we let him, if we keep our faith and keep our focus and keep running the race and keep believing and Look at that hall of fame, that hall of believers in chapter 11 and see what they went through and realize, you know what? I've got a lot better than they did. And I'm just going to keep running. I'm just going to keep going. And after all, Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, our coach in life, is waiting for us and cheering us on. I read a story about a group of missionaries that were in the Amazon jungles and they were taking some people uh, from a village to get supplies down the Amazon River. And as they were going, they were a couple miles out, they heard a bunch of commotions from another village. People were screaming, running around with machetes, and it was just utter chaos. And so the missionary pulled his boat over to see what was going on and see if he could help. And what he found out was that an anaconda had uh, taken a mother and child and was in, had them in its grips. And so the villagers had sort of got, gotten the anaconda backed into a corner, but they couldn't do much with it. So the missionary, who was a Quaker, uh, ran and got his pistol. Now, why? Uh, normally, uh, it's unusual for a Quaker to have a pistol, I thought, when I read that. But it's the Amazon, after all. But he went and got his pistol and went back to try to help. And when he did, he realized he only had one bullet. And so he had to make this count. So he got as close as he could, and he aimed right between the eyes of that anaconda and he waited till he could get a good clean shot and he fired and it was a bullseye right between the eyes of that anaconda however the anaconda when he hit the bullet hit him he went crazy <laughs> and started uh, 
chaos again and was just going everywhere, wiping everything out. And for three or four hours, he was just going crazy. Until finally, he succumbed to his injuries and died. What I want to say today is this. Satan, the old serpent, the devil, has done a lot of damage. And he continues to do that today. But I want you to realize this. He was mortally wounded when Jesus died on the cross. Jesus struck a death blow to him. And he will succumb to his injuries. And one of these days, this enemy, the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And he will no longer be able to hurt or to do damage to anyone. So just take courage and know that as we're running this race and we get tired along the way and we get fatigued or we get, we get discouraged, that God has already won. Jesus is already at the finish line waiting for us to come home. And I want you to know that he is cheering for you. So just know that. The battle's won. The race is won. And may the Lord bless you and keep you today. I want to ask the musicians to come. Just for a moment, I want to speak to you. And I want to ask you to, to listen very carefully to what I have to say. I don't know where you are in your spiritual life. On your spiritual journey. I, we're all in different places. I don't know if you feel like you're a million miles from God or if you're just next door to God. But I do know this. God loves you and He's been wanting to have a relationship with you. And all you have to do is open the door and say yes. And maybe you've been through all kinds of things. Maybe your life with God has taken some ups and downs and some curves. And maybe you just need to refocus. To get that faith back, that hope back that you once had. And to realize that Jesus is saying to you, I love you. Right now, I want to ask you to pray with me this very simple prayer. Would you pray this with me? Lord Jesus, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Amen. I want you to know that if you pray that very simple prayer, Jesus promised that if you call on him, he would never turn you away. So if you did, just rejoice and have faith because Jesus loves you. Amen.